Today we're going to speak about a great poet. We're going to speak about Virgil. His whole name was Pullius Virgilius Maro, and he was born in the year 70 BC and died in the year 19 BC. He was born to an equestrian family and he conducted his studies in Cremona first, then he moved to Milan. Eventually he continued his studies in Rome and in Naples. So he completed a wide course of studies, but he was really not good at them. Um, which were he, these studies? His studies were studies of law, rhetoric. These two disciplines often came together because you had to be able to defend and present your cause um, uh, before um, a trial. Uh, he also studied astronomy and medicine and Epicurean philosophy. That was his great passion, philosophy. He wanted to dedicate himself to philosophy, although unfortunately for him, he didn't succeed. Um, his personality, he was shy, he was reserved, and his her health was poor. So that also explains why he didn't succeed when he attempted studying law or rhetoric. Um, and it was when he encountered the Neoteric cir Circle of Poets, a circle that had been initiated by Catullus, that um, his political talent began shining. Then there comes a particular historical event. In, around the year 42 BC, the Emperor Octavian um, had to wage war against the assassins of Caesar. And then he had to reward the mercenaries and the veterans of war. And for that, he had to confiscate um, a bunch of farms, especially from the north of Italy. Among those, um, it w there was the farm of Virgil. And this drove um, Virgil to writing his bucolic or his eglog poems. His bucolic poems, they are the same. The bucolics and the eglogs were written between the year 42 and 39 BC. And in these poems, he expresses on the one hand the melancholy of uh, having to go into exile, but it was through these poems that he gained the favor of the emperor and eventually would recover his farm. Um, what is the theme of these poems? These are 10 pastoral poems um, and they are written in dactylic hexameter following the pattern of the Greek poet Theocritus. Um, the structure is a mirror-like structure where the first one corresponds with the ninth, the second with the eighth, the third with the seventh, the fourth with the sixth, and then they all converge into the fifth, and then the tenth that can be uh, seen as an epilogue. The tenth eglogue also brings together the remaining eglogues, so they have a very, very interesting structure. And a great point of these eglogs, a thing that is worth highlighting, is what has been labeled as the sense of a sweet melancholy. What is this? There's drama, there's sadness, but this is not something that tears you to pieces. Like, for example, we would see in the book Fourth of the Aeneid with Queen Dido. She's torn to pieces. But instead here, of course, there's sadness, there's drama, but it maintains always that peace, that tranquility. And of course, it's up to you to judge whether this is an accomplishment of Virgil or maybe a flaw. Maybe he didn't succeed in creating that dramatism that uh, he needed to create, or maybe it's a great quality that he always keeps a sober tone, but nonetheless, the um, lyricism and the f intensity of feelings are quite remarkable. Although he recovered his farm uh, with these poems, the greatest achievement of these poems was that he got into the circle of Mecenas. He was, to put it in the um, terms of our days, and he was like the Minister of Culture for the Emperor Augustus. And he welcomed Virgil and commissioned him with um, other projects. And uh, there was a project which is the Georgics. That is the second great work of Virgil, the Georgics, which means the work of 
of the land. Uh, there are four books. Um, the first one deals with crops, the second with trees, the third one with cattle, and the fourth one with uh, the um, beekeeping, with beekeeping. And he wrote these poems between the year 37 and 29 BC. If you count how many days there are in those eight years and how many verses there are in the Georgics, you will realize that um, the average ratio is one verse per day. One verse per day. Um, and it is not like he was a slow writer. He wrote um, very, very fast, but he polished his verse. He polished and he refined it um, indefinitely. That is why it took him so long. So according to his own testimony, he dedicated entire mornings to writing um, a bunch of verses, if the, even if they were lower quality verses. And then he dedicated the entire afternoon to polishing and refining these poems. So what we have as a result of these eight years of work is something that didn't come just like a burst of inspiration, but it's something that he worked on for years. With this, he intended to exalt the um, beauty of rural life, although it's unclear and scholars don't have a definite uh, position on what Virgil's intentions were. Because in some times, in some instances, you can see some kind of hope and optimism toward the future. But in some other instances, you see some sadness and at the same time, some kind of pessimism. So maybe he was just going through different moods and that is what is portrayed in, in the Georgics. But it's unclear what his intentions were because we know that this is a very refined work that he got to elaborate as much as he needed to. So his, re his intentions in the end remain unclear. And um, these Georgics were used um, to celebrate the victory of um, Octavian over Mark Antony and Cleopatra. Uh, that is a famous battle. And we have Horace writing his uh, hymn to celebrate this victory. But the Georgics also took part in the, in, in, in the celebrations for this victory. Finally, we come to uh, Virgil's great work, great epic poem, which is the Aeneid. The Aeneid. Um, in it, we find like several things come together. Of course, he sets foot on the epical field, and he's writing an epic poem. What do we mean with an epic poem? He's rivaling with Homer, and. Homer had given to the Greeks a major um, epic poem, actually two, the Iliad and the Odyssey, and those were foundational poems. Instead, Latin poetry didn't have a foundational poem. Nonetheless, this is not just a mere imitation of Homer, but he also takes material from what had followed after Homer, especially Apollonius of Rhodes. And uh, you can also see that the um, intervention of tragedy, of Greek tragedy, um, is also um, significant because Virgil borrows a lot from that polarity that we find in, in Greek tragedy and dialogue. That's also remarkable because um, almost a third of the Aeneid is dialogue. And that is something that he borrows from the Greek tragedy. Of course, he also owes a lot to the great lyrical poets because in the Aeneid, although he was attempting to write an epic poem, nonetheless, there's a lot of lyricism. He cannot be detached. Homer is like a journalist who's detached and just recounts things as they happened. Instead, with Virgil, he's too close to the events and he also invests a lot of his own self, of his own feelings, of his own perception. Um, unfortunately, Virgil died without completing this work. 
I estimate maybe it would have taken him 20 years to complete it. He only had like 10 or 11 years uh, before his death. So we do have all the um, chapters. They are all complete and it looks like the structure of, of each chapter is complete because they all have pretty much the same extension and they all end um, with calm, with peace, in a quiet way. So it looks like Virgil had a clear idea of the structure he was going to follow. And we have of course, most of the verses, but I do think Virgil wanted to refine many things in the in, Aeneid. So, if you find inconsistencies or incomplete verses, or maybe images that are not so well crafted, any flaw you might find in the Aeneid, I think it can be attributed to the fact that Virgil didn't finish, that he didn't complete, that he didn't polish the Aeneid as much as he wanted to. I have also a theory, and it is the placeholder theory. What do I mean with that? When we find, for example, anachronisms, and, and Virgil mentions some kind of ships that were uh, present only in the times of the Romans, and he puts them um, centuries before that time, of, of course that's an anachronism. Or when he speaks about the Roman Senate, that's an anachronism, right? Um, maybe he was just introducing those relatable elements to be closer to his readers. But if someone wants to say that he was negligent, I would argue back saying that those um, inconsistencies and those discrepancies are there only as placeholders, meaning that they wanted to keep um, the, the flow of the narrative, but that Virgil intended to go back and then adjust it and adapt it and polish it as much as it was needed. Nevertheless, this is a great poem, and although Virgil, um, before his death, wanted to have the Aeneid burned, I'm happy <laughs> his um, final desire was not uh, fulfilled, was not obeyed, and uh, that is what has given us the Aeneid as we find it, which is a great poem, and even if it is an incomplete poem, it served completely, it, it completely served the purpose of um, giving um, the Romans an epic poem, a foundational poem, and definitely Vir Virgil unquestionably revolutionized Latin poetry. Of course there are uh, poets before Virgil, poets who had attempted writing la in Latin, like Aeneas, um, but Aeneas doesn't flow smoothly. Lucretius definitely flows smoothly, and he's a great poet, Nevertheless, he didn't succeed in creating a school or followers. So Lucretius is a great poet that stands all on its own. Instead, with Virgil, we find a new tendency, a new movement set in motion thanks to the reception of uh, the Aeneid. Um, he became a standard, a model for Latin poetry, and he was introduced in, in, into the curricula and the um, uh, school studies of, of their times and of the ages to come. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's said that even some of the church fathers received Virgil uh, very, in a very benign way. I think he's the most quoted of all the church fathers. Um, uh, sorry, um, um, in the writings of the church fathers, he is the most quoted of all the um, Roman poets. Um, Lactantius and Propertius, Christian um, um, poets, call uh, Virgil or um, have Virgil in a place that almost ranks that of the apostles uh, or, or that of the prophets, sorry. And in those times, you can also understand that there was some kind of superstition. So, although Virgil intended to bring up morals and traditions, and with traditions, also religious traditions, 
this superstition um, came in and Virgil himself became some kind of soothsayer and um, Sortes Virgiliane were introduced. Sortes Virgiliane means some kind of bibliomancy, means, meaning divination through a book. So um, it was believed that the work of Virgil was um, divinely inspired and they resorted to these texts to find some soothsaying for the future or about how to conduct their everyday affairs. And the very tomb of Virgil became a, a destination of pilgrimages and um, as a consequence of all the attention that was given to the Aeneid, Homeric studies declined. Um, without a doubt, he's the most influential poet um, all through the Middle Ages. You can see his influence in his own time and how he influenced his great poet Horace, his great friend, the poet Horace. Um, eventually Dante would admire him to the point of making Virgil his guide through the Divine Comedy. Uh, the reception during the Renaissance was also remarkable and mm, quite a few um, authors of the Renaissance attempted to write eggloggs following the pattern and the example of Virgil. In the Spanish Golden Century, you also have poets like Garcilaso de la Vega, Fray Luis de Leon, Lope de Vega, all of them borrowing a lot from Virgil. Um, in English literature, for example, you have Dryden, and John Dryden has given us a very beautiful translation of the Aeneid. So, um, summing up, this is uh, the greatness of the legacy of Virgil, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you.